בטנדן של קומות שלא הכרתי, נכנסת מבלי לחשב, וטיקטוק היה דמעות על הלחיים. I would like to welcome all who are joining us from the United States and Israel and from around the world to this, the third and final installment of our three-part Judea and Samaria virtual mega event, co-hosted by Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Zionist Organization of America. I am Alan Jay, National Director of Outreach and Engagement at the Zionist Organization of America. Not only is the ZOA a tireless and powerful defender against all forms of anti-Semitism, We are also the loudest and most courageous voice defending the Jewish state of Israel's sovereign rights, which include Judea and Samaria, the Jordan Valley, and all of Jerusalem as Israel's exclusive capital. Today's program is the third installment of a three-part series. In early February, Yesha Council, My Israel, and ZOA brought to you part one of the series called Judea and Samaria, the great opportunity for the successful future of the state of Israel and the entire Middle East. Just two weeks ago, we broadcast the program Guarding Area C, dealing with the danger of illegal Arab takeover of Judea and Samaria. And today's program, a cooperative effort of Yesha Council, My Israel, One Israel Fund, SSI, Preserving the Eternal, and ZOA, is entitled Archaeology and Heritage, the Systematic Destruction of Biblical Sites and Antiquity. If you missed an earlier program, or if you'd like to watch it again, the entire three-part Judea and Samaria mega series will be available for future viewing on our ZOA YouTube channel. Just go to www.zoa.org. Our host and moderator for today's program will be the Director of Tourism and Community Development at One Israel Fund, Eve Harrow. Eve is a veteran Israeli tour guide, a public speaker, and she is the host of the weekly podcast, Rejuvenation. Eve has a master's degree in psychology from Pepperdine University and a master's degree in Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology from Bar Ilan University. Eve has lived in Efrat since making Aliyah from Los Angeles in 1988. She has served on the local council for a decade and has been heavily involved in grassroots politics. Eve and her physician husband are blessed to have seven grandchildren and at last count 10 grandchildren and Bezrat Hashem still counting. Eve, from all of us here at ZOA and from all of our partners in this important effort, thank you for your lifetime commitment to enhancing Jewish life in Yehuda and Shomron. The program is all yours. Thank you so much, Alan. That's seven children and 10 grandchildren and counting. Can't take credit for more than that. I'm delighted to have been asked to moderate the final mega event sponsored by some of the most incredible pro-Israel organizations that are around. And we are extremely honored to open with a few words from no less than the president of Israel, Mr. Isaac Herzog. On Hanukkah, he lit candles in the tomb of the patriarchs, Marata Machpila in Hebron, emphasizing how important our heritage sites are to him, Bechavod, President Herzog. Dear friends, I welcome this important platform, the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event, as an opportunity to affirm the millennia old bonds of history and heritage, binding the Jewish people to this land, the land of Israel. Much of the Jewish people's history in this land is rooted in the hills and valleys of Judea and Samaria. Here, in Yehuda Shomron, our patriarchs and matriarchs lived and were laid to rest. Here, Joshua led the sons and daughters of Israel, Bnei Israel, into the land. King David began his rule. Our prophets spread their teachings, which we teach until today and every Shabbat. And Jewish rebels, from the Maccabees to Bar Kokhba, fought for what they believed in. Beyond any political dispute, We should all agree to protect the integrity of Jewish historical and archaeological sites throughout the land of Israel, as well as historical sites belonging to other religions and cultures which have left their stamp on this region throughout the ages. This is not just a Jewish or Israeli issue, but an issue of protecting the heritage of all humanity in the Holy Land. Dear friends, it is our duty to guarantee through word and action that there is no contradiction between Israel's unique status as the Jewish national home 
and its existence as a democracy built on equality and religious freedom. A democracy which welcomes, respects, and makes room for all of God's creations. As we work to preserve the past, we must also lay the groundwork for a safe, hopeful future based on a viable peace in the region. As the historic Abraham Accords have shown, the path to peace runs through win-win cooperation, tolerance, and dialogue. I pray that the new winds of peace blowing through our region will enable us to work together to lay the foundations for a future of coexistence, stability, and mutual prosperity. I would like to thank Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Zionist Organization of America for organizing this important conference. Just like my predecessor, President Rivlin, I thank you, dear friends in Israel and in the United States, for all that you do on behalf of Am Israel and Medinat Israel. Take good care. Thank you, President Herzog, for those beautiful and meaningful words and for understanding the importance of the events that we have been running for the past few weeks. Our next guest is member of Knesset Amichai Shikli, a loyal and outspoken supporter of Jewish life in Judea and Samaria. A veteran educator, he devotes himself in his precious spare time to teaching the young generation about their heritage and Jewish and Israeli values. Member of Knesset, Amichai Shikli. Shalom lekulam, hello everyone. Thank you for gathering this very important evening. Thank you to Moetzit Yesha, ZOA, and my Israel, Israel Sheli. One of our famous poets, Nathan Alterman, said, an am asher isog mechafirot chayav. No nation will abandon the ruins of its life, the, event, the archaeological sites, and our legacy. In Judea and Samaria, we have 3,000 um, hugely important archaeological sites. Um, one of them is Shiloh, ancient Shiloh, the first capital of Israel. One of them is Mizbech Yehoshua on Arival. One of them is Armonot HaChashmonaim, right above Yericho. All of these sites in the past uh, past few years are being uh, demolished and ruined by Palestinians uh, with damage that in many of the cases we cannot recover the damage. Um, and that's a very, um, it, it, it's, it's tragic and it's dangerous for Israel because the Palestinians are actually trying to wipe out the Jewish legacy in uh, Judea and Samaria. In one of the cases, they are even building a mosque upon uh, an archaeological site of the Hashmonite in Tel Aroma. A few weeks ago, I wrote a letter to the deputy of the Ministry of Defense, Mr. Alon Schuster, and I explained the situation, which is very grave, and um, he promised to work on it. He wrote, he wrote back a letter. Um, the NGO, Shomrim al Netzach, led by Moshe Gutman, um, is, was very uh, helpful to understand the uh, gravity of the situation. Um, and I hope that we will uh, be able to promote a uh, solution to what's happening now in Judea and Samaria. Also, in one of the Knesset committees, um, we had a discussion about this issue. And a uh, pro-Palestinian uh, Knesset member, a huge problem by itself um, shouted loud about uh, that we shouldn't uh, uh, um, interfere what's happening in Judea and Samaria and there was a debate uh, and then I asked them can you mention one Palestinian archaeological site in Judea and Samaria we are all waiting to hear from you there was complete silence um, and I think that's the proof to uh, <laughs> the simple truth. This is our homeland. Uh, that's the very beginning of, of um, Jewish history. The fathers, uh, the early stages of Am Israel in Eretz Israel, Mount Eval, Shiloh, etc. In the Gemara, there's a quote. It says, there are three places that Umot Olam cannot say that they do not belong to Am Israel. Ma'arat ha-machpela, ובמקום גבורתו של יוסף, וגורן הרבנה, בהר המוריה, שזה הר הבית. Thank you for listening, and good luck.
Thank you so much, Chaver Knesset, member of Knesset, Amichai Shikli, and for all that you do. Danny Luz is ZOA's representative in Israel. Before working with ZOA, he worked as a close advisor to various political personalities, including M.K. Nir Barkat, M.K. Yariv Levine, as well as the last two prime ministers of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu and the current prime minister, Naftali Bennett. Iluz is a lawyer trained at McGill Law School, specializing in international law. Dan is also a former member of the Jerusalem City Council. He made Aliyah from Montreal, Canada, and now lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Batel. A few words from Danny Luz. Thank you, Eve. The Judea and Samaria mega event is meant to bring the reality of Judea and Samaria to your homes in America in order for you to gain a better understanding of what is happening here in Israel. It has been a tremendous success with hundreds of attendees week after week and is brought to you thanks to a partnership between ZOA, which I am honored to represent, the Yesha Council and Israel Sheli. I want to start by thanking our friends and partners who helped organize this event. Thank you to the Yesha Council, especially Igal and Dorit, for all the work you do defending the rights of the Jewish people to their land. Thank you to Sarah Haetz Nikoen and Israel Sheli for your strong and ideological work. Thank you also to the One Israel Fund and to SSI who have partnered with us on the current event. Thank you also to Alan, Jackie and Omer who have made this event possible behind the scenes. You don't see them, but they work hard to make this event possible. Today's event is about the archeology span in Judea and Samaria and those who try to destroy it for political gain. Judea and Samaria is the heartland of the Jewish people. It is in this land that Abraham bought a plot of land to bury Sarah in Hebron. It is here that Jacob dreamt his famous dream in Bethel. It is here that Joseph, Joseph went to look for his brothers in Shechem. It is here where the Jewish people entered the land of Israel through the Jordan River. It is here that the tabernacle stood for years in Shiloh. It is here that King David was born in Bethlehem. While we love every centimeter of the land of Israel, yes, we truly do, it is important to know that Jewish history did not originate in Tel Aviv, but in Judea and Samaria. Therefore, the roots to the rights to our land are specifically in Judea and Samaria. And it is specifically this fact that our enemies try to uproot when they destroy the archeological treasures in Judea and Samaria. Yes, they know exactly what they are doing. Our enemies want to disconnect the land of Israel from Jewish history in order to claim that we are a colonialist power that came to a foreign land. Nothing can obviously be further from the truth, and the archaeology in Judea and Samaria is the clearest proof of that fact. The Jewish people is native to Israel. Our very name, Jews, come from the word Judea. In contrast, there isn't even one Palestinian heritage site in Judea and Samaria. When Israel negotiates its rights to Judea and Samaria, it hurts the very foundation of our rights to the whole land of Israel. When Israel fails to apply sovereignty in Judea and Samaria, it hurts our sovereignty not only in Judea and Samaria, but also over Petah Tikva and Netanya. We at ZOA oppose any attempt to give away these historical lands, not only because of the serious security consequences of such a move, but first and foremost, because these lands justify our presence in all of Israel. As I said, our enemies know what they are doing when they destroy the archaeology in Judea and Samaria, and we must do everything we can to stop them. It is time for the free world to unite against those who destroy history, warp the truth, 
and negate archaeology. When ISIS destroyed archaeology, the whole world went crazy, and justifiably so. When the Palestinians destroy incredibly important archaeological findings, the world stays silent. In fact, instead of opposing Palestinians negating history, they fan this flame with ridiculous resolutions coming out of bodies like UNESCO. Let it be clear, on this subject, there is no difference between ISIS and the Palestinians. This event today is here to make some noise and to encourage you to also make some noise. Speak up and do not let the world stay silent. While we call on the Israeli government to do everything needed to protect the archaeology of Judea and Samaria, we also call on the free world not to allow the Palestinians, who live of foreign aid, I remind you, to keep destroying history. We hope this event will give you the tools to join us in this important fight in order to help us defend Judea and Samaria. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for explaining so cogently what these issues are. And these are not just the issues of the Jews living in, in Yehuda Shomron in Judea and Samaria, but they are really worldwide issues. They are global issues. And the destruction that happens here is really taking away the history of mankind. And uh, it is invaluable and irreplaceable. Our next guest is Valeria Chazin, the co-founder and chair of the board of directors of Students Supporting Israel, SSI, a nonprofit with chapters on campuses across North America with the mission to be a clear and confident voice for Israel and promote grassroots activism. Valeria grew up in Israel and after completing her military service, earned a Bachelor of Science degree in business and marketing from the University of Minnesota, as well as a law degree. She is the recipient of the Pfeffer Memorial Award of the Twin Cities Cordoza Legal Society, of the Women of Intention World Favor Award of the Minneapolis Jewish Federation's Pearl Society, and of several other national activism awards on behalf of SSI. She is a speaker on the topics of Israel and Zionism, and has been involved as a volunteer board or committee member with several Jewish and non-Jewish com community organizations and pro bono legal services. Valeria, the floor is yours. Hello everyone. I would like to greet all of you who are watching this program and to thank the Zionist Organization of America for inviting me to address today's session and also thank the Yesha Council and my Israel that together with the ZOA organized this three series virtual event. This meeting's specific topic, the historic rights to the land and the attempt to destroy anything proving it is extremely relevant to what I do every day. For those unfamiliar with students supporting Israel, we founded the movement a decade ago after witnessing the incredible amount of misinformation spread about Israel on college campuses and decided it is our duty to act to make sure young people will be hearing facts to counter the vicious lies presented about Zionism and the land of Israel. Our mission statement is to be a clear and confident for Israel voice on college campuses and to support students in grassroots for Israel advocacy. We've been active on nearly 200 campuses in the USA, Canada, Argentina, and other locations with thousands of executed events on university grounds. And we're also happy to partner with ZOA's campus department on programs we hold. One of the most central discussion topics on campuses is related to Judea and Samaria. Some of the most frequent claims we hear include statements such as Jewish settlements are the biggest obstacle for peace and they are illegal, or Jews are colonialists from Europe and are not indigenous to the land but stealing Palestinian land. It is extremely important that young people know how to counter such claims. But unfortunately, we see many young Jewish people and Zionist activists who reach campuses and are not prepared on how to respond. A program like this today is important because if we want others to know our history, we must know it ourselves. If someone outside of Israel cannot acknowledge the Jewish connection to Judea and Samaria, how can they acknowledge a Jewish connection to any part of this land? Terminology is very important. 
we should be using the term Judea and Samaria instead of the West Bank. As simple as that, as this terminology alone suggests a Jewish connection to the area. An interesting observation can be made about the development of the terminology that is used by international bodies like the United Nations when referring to Judea and Samaria. It started from general reference to territories in the aftermath of the Six Days War and developed over the decades to the capitalized phrase of occupied Palestinian territories. This shift in terminology by international bodies attempts to assign the title of the land to the Palestinians, but we need to keep teaching about what are the legitimate Jewish claims to the land. Then it is also knowing about the places where our Jewish heritage was created. So many Jewish sites exist in Judea and Samaria, such as the Cave of Patriarchs, Rachel Stump, and more, and denying this or not being aware of it is ignoring facts and reality on the ground. It is important, of course, also to be educated on international laws and more recent history, such as treaties that recognize the Jewish rights to the land. For example, the text of the League of Nations uh, mandate for Palestine makes a vital acknowledgement of the connection between the Jewish people and the land, stating that an historical connection exists. It also lays down the rights of the Jewish people to settle in the entire area of the mandate, which according to all maps included Judea and Samaria. On many college campuses, people are not aware, for example, that now the area is divided into areas A, B, and C, and even if they are aware, they do not know the specifics. Many accuse Israel on campuses for its actions, but do not say a word about the terror of rocks flying on Israeli cars. As you may see, there is a lot of work to be done to educate about Judea and Samaria, its rich Jewish past and present. Working with college students, we spend a lot of time teaching young Zionists on campus grounds, coaching them on how to battle misinformation about Israel, informing them about historical and recent facts. This program is important as it provides a lot of content, and I'm sure anyone watching it will become so much more knowledgeable on the topic. Thank you so much, and I wish you all a wonderful session today. Thank you so much, Valeria. And I think we all understand how very important the work on college campuses is, where some of our brightest young people are literally being brainwashed to be anti-Israel, to not understand what's happening here at all. And uh, the ramifications for that are just enormous. Um, the people that dig here in Israel, the archaeologists that dig here in Israel are not just Israeli archaeologists, although we have some of the best ones in the world, but also archaeologists who come from all over the world. Our next talk, a TED style talk, will be given by Dr. Scott Stripling. He has been the director of excavations for the Associates for Biblical Research at Ancient Shiloh since 2017. He also serves as provost and director of the Archaeology Institute at the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas. Previously, Stripling directed the ABR excavations at Khirbet El Makatir, served as field supervisor at Tal El Khaman in Jordan, and is a supervisor of the Temple Mount Sifting Project in Jerusalem. He serves as vice president of the board of directors of the Near East Archaeological Society and has published widely in peer-reviewed journals, popular magazines, and books. He is a popular speaker at churches and conferences around the world, and he guests on numerous television programs and documentaries, such as Fox News, The 700 Club, The New York Times, TBN, History Channel, and The Discovery Channel. His passion is connecting the material culture of the Holy Land with the biblical text. Scott and Janet, his wife of 38 years, have four grown children and four grandchildren. It is an honor to present a TED Talk from Dr. Scott Stripling. Hi, I'm Scott Stripling, the Director of Excavations at Ancient Shiloh and previously at Kerbet El Makatir. I'm speaking to you today from the Bible Seminary in Katy, Texas, inside the Archaeological Institute, where we have the Joshua Judges and Jesus uh, exhibit that opens on March the 1st. 
So I wanted to share with you a little bit about the challenges of excavating in Judea and Samaria. But first, let me give you some of my uh, own journey. Uh, I've excavated at a number of sites in Judea and Samaria, but uh, also in other countries like Jordan, and um, also in specific projects like we've done on the Temple Mount and later at uh, Mount Ebal, which I'll touch on later. But primarily, my organization, the Associates for Biblical Research, excavated in the highlands of Israel at Kerbet Nisia, beginning in 1979, and then later at Kerbet el Makathir, and now at uh, Shiloh. So we have over 40 years of excavation uh, in that region. So I think it's safe to say that we know it pretty well, and some of the challenges that uh, take place there. We began excavation prior to the Oslo Accords, and of course things have changed a bit politically now, and we continue to work there, even though very few groups do. If you were to look at a map of excavated sites in Israel, you would see a high concentration in the coastal plain and in the Shefela, and then you would look in the central hill country, and you would assume that not much was happening there during the biblical period, because you would have very few dots there. The truth is that the heartland of Israel is where most of the action was in biblical times, but most outward groups, universities and organizations, are not willing to take the political heat that comes with excavating in Judea and Samaria. Uh, my organization uh, is not bothered by that. Um, we're there to do archaeology and we'll work with whatever governmental entity happens to have sovereignty in that, in that region. But our ex excavations have revealed a regional view of what was happening during biblical times. Um, my group, the Associates for Biblical Research, is comprised of a number of universities. Currently, we have 11 universities that are working with us, uh, in addition to the different Israeli universities with, uh, with which we partner using their labs and their personnel and grad students and so forth for, uh, for various things. So we have uh, fought vandalism all of these years. If, uh, if a site happens to be adjacent to to a Jewish community such as Kerbet Nisia or now with Shiloh, the site normally enjoys a high level of protection. At Shiloh, the local community fortunately guards the site for us to a, such an extent that we're able to leave our tools in our excavation squares. That is not the case at almost anywhere else that you would go. 99.9% .9 of the sites are in danger, um, oftentimes like at Kerbet el Makathir, we have a Jewish village, Givar Asav on one side, and then a Palestinian village, Deir Divwan, on the other side, and it's sort of like being in the Wild West. We can exercise some degree of control while we're in the field if I hire security guards to watch the site overnight. Um, if not, then what we excavated one day is, is demolished overnight, walls are knocked down, uh, the site is vandalized, van people come in with metal detectors and sometimes even heavy equipment and dig up what we're trying to excavate. And of course, this destroys the stratigraphy, and this is what's most important for, for me as an archaeologist, is that we preserve the stratigraphy uh, intact. So it's uh, safe to say that every site in the West Bank is a salvage site. Now, people use different nomenclatures, Area C, the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, and each carries its own political con connotation with it. But the stakes are high, and um, I have been sued on uh, two different occasions. Um, the case has made it to the Israeli Supreme Court, where I had to submit briefs to the court, and uh, ultimately the court fortunately dismissed and uh, ruled in my favor without prejudice. But uh, the attempt of these groups, and they're leftist groups, one is Jewish, the other is Palestinian, is of course to put pressure on an organization that has a board of directors back in the States, and normally university boards of directors get very nervous when there's lawsuits uh, involved. And so this explains why not many groups have been willing to, uh, to excavate. Outside the salvage projects that have been carried out by the civil administration of Judea and Samaria, and the projects that, that uh, my organization, ABR, has, has led, very little has happened in the last two generations. We think about those early days when Harvard and, and others were working at places like Shechem and, and great work was taking place. Uh, it's a different story today, and the antiquities are really in great peril. Think about Mount Ival, where we recently did a project sifting through um, Adam Zertal's dump piles from the 1980s. After we completed that work, the outer enclosure of the, the foot-shaped enclosure 
um, underwent significant damage, and you had locals who were little, literally grinding up that stone and turning it into gravel. Such is the case. Now, the Antiquities Authority has a relatively small budget. They have thousands of sites that they have to monitor and protect, and so they do what they can, but in reality, you, you just have hundreds and maybe even thousands of sites that are unprotected. And uh, it's not only from, uh, from Arabs in the West Bank, you, from time to time. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had uh, some, some Jewish residents near Shiloh where there was some unauthorized destruction done to antiquities there as well. But um, for us, it's a, a big problem because as an archeologist, we only get one shot. We can't go back and recreate the evidence. We can't go back and stage the scene and re-excavate it. So to have the opportunity like we did at Kirpel al Makatir to excavate before the site has houses illegally built on top of it, which is no doubt what's happening now, um, is critically important. And so behind me you see artifacts uh, from the site and how we were able to, over a 21-year period, um, fight those difficult odds, you know, hiking up mountains with no water and no bathrooms and dealing with a difficult uh, excavation experience, but to, to professionally, slowly, scientifically excavate and then publish and tell the story um, and then, of course, move on to the next regional site is, is critically important. Um, so suffice it to say that there are a myriad of challenges excavating in Area C, Judea, Samaria, but uh, that's also from my area of research interest, which is the, the settlement of early Israel in the conquest period and on into the settlement period. That's where the, the evidence lies, and that's, that's why we're focused on that, that particular region. Um, I was asked to say just a few words before I close about a big story that you may have already caught wind of. Um, I'm currently working on a scientific academic publication on a small curse tablet, a folded lead tablet, what we would call a defixio or an amulet, um, from Mount Ivad that we, we recovered from Adam Zertal's uh, dump piles there in December of 2019. Um, using tomographic scans at a European university, we were able to penetrate the lead and recover text on the inside of it. And so we'll be telling uh, everyone about this in great detail, but I have to say it's, it's very exciting. Uh, we, we definitely have text, and we uh, know that it's, it's not a late text. Uh, it's something that's going to bring a lot of interest. And so I hope by mid-year to have the, the final publication, working with epigraphers and scientists right now to try to dot every I and cross every T before we uh, bring that public. But I appreciate everyone's interest, and if you'll bear with us just a few more months, we hope to give you uh, more details on that. So I'll share some pictures with uh, Eve and Devir and others so that they then uh, can share them with you. So uh, thank you for your interest in what's happening in Judea and Samaria. If you'd like to connect with me, you can do so through the Bible Seminary at thebibleseminary.edu or my personal website, scottstripling.net or through our DIG website, which is digshiloh with an H, digshiloh.org. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Dr. Stripling. I have had the privilege of interviewing Scott Stripling a few times over the years, uh, participating in some of the digs with him. And it's just so important to have a perspective of an archeologist who is not an Israeli, who does not live here. This is not political for him. He wants to uncover the truth. He wants to uncover the history of this area. That is the only agenda that he has. And uh, I hope that he gets back to Israel soon. As I know for many of the archeologists, the last two years have been incredibly difficult, unable to get their teams here and dig. And of course, their concern that things will not be the same once they get back here. Our next talk will be given by Adi Shragai. Adi Shragai earned a BA in Jewish history and archaeology and is currently completing her master's degree in archaeology, both at the esteemed Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She has worked at the excavations in Tel Achish and the city of David, which is, of course, ancient Jerusalem. She and her husband and three young daughters live on the Mount of Olives. Adi serves as activities coordinator for Shomrim al in English, Preserving the Eternal, an organization that was founded a few years ago in response to the desecration and destruction of heritage sites occurring on a daily basis in Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. The official bodies in Israel have unfortunately not responded in an effective way, and the impact that the organization is having is to a great degree the core of tonight's programming. Adi. Thank you, Eve.
Let me just see, uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, great and historic events took place in the land of, his, of Israel since the dawn of history and through all periods. The lands of Judea and Samaria are the heart of the land of the Bible and the richness of the research inherited in the earth connects in actual evidence the Jewish nation to its historical national heritage. Fortunately, in recent years, we witnessed systematic and unprecedented destruction of the archaeological sites by the Palestinian Authority in Judea and Samaria. Walls and fortifications are being destroyed day by day. Archaeological sites are looted. Important finds are being stolen from them, and antiquity robbers make them as within themselves. In many cases, we do not have the ability to know what has disappeared and what has been lost from us forever. This disturbing reality led us to conduct the National Heritage Survey, which is the first survey of its kind whose purpose is to take a snapshot and give a scientific and accurate picture on the level of preservation and damage of the archeological sites of Judea and Samaria. In the survey, we selected the, the 365 most important archaeological sites for um, the national and world cultural heritage that were documented in the study. And they were mapped according to the level of damage caused to them, the type of damage, the cause of the damage, and the reason of it. The findings of the survey indicated a serious and unprecedented damage to the condition of the heritage sites in recent years. We found that 80% of the survey sites, which is 289 in number, were damaged moderately and severely. We found that all 24 sites in importance group A have been damaged in recent years, and almost half of them are in immediate danger of extinction. Um, the survey findings show that 70% of the damages are ongoing over long periods of time and are done mostly using heavy tools. An analysis of the causes of the severe damage to the heritage sites in Judea and Samaria revealed that they are divided into three types, Palestinian elements, uh, internal Israeli elements, and international factors. As for the Palestinian elements, not only does the Palestinian Authority not maintain and protect heritage sites, it is responsible for about 90% of their damages. Its stated goals are to undermine the historical connection of the Jewish people to the provinces of Judea and Samaria and to take over the territory. In order to do so, it encourages, or at least allows, massive damage to um, two heritage sites that are important to the Israeli narrative and Jewish heritage in blatant violation of its obligations under the Oslo Accords. Moreover, in the archeological site it is interested in, in developing, it conducts itself in a matter that is contrary to accepted international standards of site preservation. Another, another factor in cause of damage to the sites is their importance for the formation of national identity. The more meaning and influence the site and its findings have on the creation and design of the national narrative and national identity, and the more prominent their connection to, con to contemporary political questions, um, the more likely they are to be at risk of harm and destruction. And indeed, injuries found in ancient, in ancient churches and ancient synagogues were made not for the sake of economic gain, but solely for the sake of an ideological national motive. A clear example of a site whose damage was uh, due to its historical importance and centrality in the Jewish national and religious identity is the altar of Joshua on Mount Eval, the altar that was built with the entry of the people of Israel into the land as described in the Bible. The Palestinian Authority is well aware of the importance of the site to the national narrative and Jewish identity and declared war on it. 
Um, the authority began paving a ring road around the site deli and deliberately demolished about 40 meters of the site's ancient wall, which stood there for over 3,000 years. Um, I would like to show you a short video um, from the Facebook page of the nearby city Atsira Ashamalia, in which the contractor of the fieldwork was seen with the diggers behind him proudly saying that they were grinding and smashing the piles of stones from this site. So let me try. Um, Adi, Adi, just a minute. We didn't see your slides. Oh. Oh, just, okay. right now we see the Mount Eval. Okay. Okay. Do you see the video? Let me show the video just one second yes we see the video snake play At least the video is not working, so you have to say it okay. by your word. Uh, I will, uh, just one second. Well, it's just as I described. Um, let me try and share my screen again. Can you see my um, my slideshow? Yep. No. Okay, so I will just continue talking. Um, so just a month ago, we discovered another destruction, and this time inside the structure of the altar itself. No effort has been made to maintain the site, and it is constantly exposed to both weather damage and deliberate damage by the Palestinian Authority. Another site that is used by the Palestinian Authority for the deliberate erasure of Jewish heritage is Tel Aroma, which is identified with the biblical aroma that was the city of rule of Avimelech and is hid in it by a Hasmonean fortress with an impressive water system. Um, it functioned as a city of rule during the Hasmonean kingdom and expanded our knowledge of the spread of the Hasmonean kingdom. The Palestinian Authority has chosen this site as a Palestinian national stronghold and a symbol of a firm grip. It flattened the top of the mound while fatally damaging the antiquities and built the Martyr's Mosque there. Um, international foreign state entities back the Palestinian activity uh, to the destruction and fund directly and indirectly the destruction operations. The financing of the active damage to the sites is also joined by an international academic boycott of researchers that are working in Judea and Samaria, which prevents theoretical and applied academic research on the archeological sites um, scattered in this area and assists in their abandonment by the perpetrators. Another cause for this massive destruction is the helplessness of the state of Israel, which embezzles her role to preserve and protect the heritage sites. The civil administration, which is in charge of the antiquities in Samaria, is neither able nor so eager to take over the destruction. It surrenders to the course of the Palestinians' organized takeover of Area C, even when it is right in an antiquity site and they give up in advance the exposure of the heritage that may lie beneath it. Needless to say that such a directive is contrary to the antiquities law and cannot occur within the boundaries of the Green Line. Our recommendations for action are for the State of Israel to take responsibility for heritage sites in Judea and Samaria and to adopt a national emergency plan that includes um, actions to stop the ongoing damage to the sites, um, documentation and preservation of the exposed findings, the transfer of administrative responsibility for the heritage sites in Judea and Samaria 
from the civil administration to the antiquities authority. And at the international level, government activity is proposed against bodies that are involved in the damage and its funding to its her to heritage sites directly or indirectly. Um, at the academic level, a diplomatic struggle is proposed against the perpetrators of the boy boycott and the encouragement of international research at heritage sites in Judea and Samaria. Our challenge is to preserve the heritage so that there is so that there is something to pass on to future generations. We work to ensure that the state of Israel will take responsibility and stop these damages so that researching and new discoveries can continue and our heritage will be preserved. Possible and we intend to continue and we succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much to Adi. Um, we're sorry about the technical difficulties and we will do what we can that on the tapes and on the YouTube links that you can get the tapes of all these three shows, the uh, slides that Adi wanted to present will be available to all of you. The next part of our show is going to be a panel between myself and Eliana Pastantin. We are each presenting a site, Eliana Shiloh, myself, Sebastia, Two sites that were both capitals, just as was Jerusalem. Two very different sites, both in where they are and both how they are being kept up. Eliana Pasantin serves as International Desk Director of the Binyamin Regional Council. She was born in San Francisco in 1973 and immigrated to Israel as a child in 1987. Since 1996, she has lived in Eli, which is a mixed secular and religious community in the Binyamin region with her husband and eight children, and as of last night, her first grandchild. Eliana has earned both bachelor's and master's degrees in Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology at Bar Ilan University. She's an expert on the region, and in addition to her job at the Regional Council, she gives lectures and boutique tours of Judea and Samaria, and occasionally sleeps for two to three hours a night. It is my great honor to present Eliana Pastantin and her show on Shiloh. Thank you so much, Eve. And let's go to Shiloh. So welcome everyone. I want to thank Egal, Dilmoni, the ZOA and the Esha Council uh, for this opportunity. And let's try and go on our tour of ancient Shiloh. So I understand that time is limited and oh. hopefully you can all see, you can all see my screen. And we're going to go on a virtual tour of ancient Chilo, Israel's first capital for 369 years. So you can see this is a bird's eye view of the site. I'm gonna quickly run you through our beautiful site. This is my most favorite site in Israel and I'm so happy for this opportunity Eve, to share it with everyone. So we're gonna rush through as if, you know, we're waiting for you all to come back to Israel. And those of you who are here and those of you who will come in the, in the near future, this is just a quick walk through. A quick walkthrough. You can see uh, during COVID, we've had lots of events, and you're welcome to celebrate your bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah, uh, and anything you would like to. This is a, this is the most beautiful um, gift shop in Israel. But I want to walk you through and take you to the top of the site to the tell. So this is the entrance, and we are going straight up to the top of ancient Chilo. Just one second. Straight up to the top to Migdal Haro'e, to the tower. Now, Shiloh was Israel's first capital for 369 years. For 40 years, the children of Israel wandered through the desert with Moshe Rabbeinu leading them. After 40 years, Yoshua Binun enters Israel, bringing the tabernacle to Shiloh. First of all, they stopped in Gilgal, seven years of conquering, seven years of settling. And then Hashem tells Yoshua to establish Israel's first capital and what I like to call Israel's first state here uh, in Shiloh. So for 369 years, there's 369 years of Aliyah la Regel, of pilgrimage, 369 years of Kehuna, of priesthood. And the Mishkan stood for that time, for that amount of time, right over here on the northern plateau, uh, 100 cubits by 50 cubits. Uh, going east to west, the Kodesh HaKodeshim was in the west. And we can see what it looks like standing here. I just want to show you. And I want to share a 
personal story of why Shiloh is so special and so close to my heart. So if we look here, this is obviously, it doesn't look like this today, but in ancient times, we believed that the Mishkan stood here. This is also the place of Hannah's prayer. And my personal story is I live in the town of Eli, named for Eli Kohen. So here we have the Kohen, here we have Eli. And if you look closely up on top of this mountain, if you look carefully, you can see two homes. My home is the one on the right. We lived in a caravan for 10 years on different hilltops and uh, established Eli and, and uh, a small town called Rechelim. After 10 years in a caravan, we realized that it's important to, uh, to, to build. And we built our home overlooking ancient Chilo, the place of the Mishkan, and we were digging the infrastructure for our home. We found hundreds of ancient pottery shards. I brought you some to see. Um, I was studying at the time, at, for, I was studying archeology span and land of Israel studies at bar -Ilan University, took a pillowcase, stuffed it with pottery shards, drove to bar -Ilan, and asked my professor to help me date some of the pieces of pottery. He looked at me like I was crazy and said, this is totally illegal, but I said that the pottery shards are not from an ancient site, they're from my backyard said, where do you live? And I said, I live in a Lee named for Elia Kohen, overlooking Shiloh and what's called Bechol Haro'eh, as far as the eye can see. And I want you to look at the hills surrounding Shiloh. This is the ancient Tel. This is Israel's first capital for 369 years. And from almost every mountain, you can see the Mishkan. And this is back again, back at my home. I always tell people that come to our home that this is where they invented the disposable dishes. Now, what happened? Ancient times, people would come from all over, from all over Israel three times a year to offer their sacrifices. And according to the Talmud uh, in Megillah and in Zvachim, you don't have to uh, stay in Shiloh to eat your sacrifice. You can eat them as far as the eye can see from any one of these hilltops. And when I said that this is where they invented this disposable dishes, pottery is porous. It absorbs the holiness of the, the kedusha, of the korban, of the sacrifice. And therefore, you have to break the dishes because there's something called notar. So we have broken dishes from Jewish families from 3,500 years ago all over our backyard. And it's not just in our backyard. It's all the mountains surrounding Shiloh. And it's fascinating it's exciting and we planned our home uh, our home was planned just like the homes we use the uh, the blueprint of the homes found in the excavations in Shiloh uncovered by archaeologists it's the it's the home from the time of Yoshua Binun it's called a Beit Arbat Merchavim it's divided into four from a bird's eye view our home looks exactly like those ancient homes few differences we have underfloor heating I don't think Yoshua <laughs> did but the idea is to connect to the past we connect to the past we live in the present and we're looking towards the future. We face, we look down in the morning. When I dive in, in the morning, I look down at the place of Hannah's prayer, but I'm facing Yerushalayim and that's our future. Um, just one last uh, until we, we go over to you and I'd love to hear about Sebastian. We're talking about from Israel's first capital. We're talking about capital cities and the meaning. But for almost 400 years, the Mishkan stands here. Shiloh means shalva umenucha, means resting and tranquility. Yerushalayim is the nachala. Yerushalayim is our inheritance. And that's where we're going. And that's what we're looking towards. So in our home, we planned, as I said, every one of our windows faces a different historic view. In our dining room, when you sit down at the dining room table, you look straight out the windows down at Chilo. We kindly ask our guests not to break the dishes after the meal, like in ancient times. They can wash them or clear them. But really, I would like to invite everyone to come to this beautiful must-see site, and we'll talk a little bit more. You tell me a little bit about your favorite site. Okay, thank you so much, Eliana, for an absolutely fascinating presentation um, on Shiloh. If you go off screen, then I can share my screen. And there we go. Okay, share screen and photos. Okay, uh, this is going to be not such a lighthearted presentation as uh, a feel-good presentation as Eliana's. Um, the site that's known as Shomron and as Sebastia um, was the capital of the Kingdom of Israel, starting from about minus 884 with Omri the king. Remember our history? Um, after the time of Solomon, the kingdom split into Israel and into Judah, and Jerusalem is the capital of Judah. And after roaming around for a little bit until they finally settle on a capital, 
they settle on Shomron. And eventually the area is called that because um, it's bought from a family named Shemer. Uh, eventually the city is named Shomron and eventually the entire area as we know it is called the Shomron. So this site, which later on is called Sebastia during the time of Herod the Great, but that's only hundreds of years later, is one of the capitals of our people. Now, as you can see from this picture, it is being encroached upon by an Arab village of the same name, actually building on the tell itself. And this is, of course, an aerial view. You can see at the bottom of the picture, part of the tell, you can see the pillars that, uh, that were put up on the road. And look at what you see here, this egregious example of the chutzpah, the absolute nerve of the Palestinian Authority. This, is, uh, this site is part of Ratag. It's part of the Israel National Parks Authority. Yet there is a very large Palestinian flag planted right in the parking lot. Unfortunately, with the Oslo Accords, even though this park is part of the in Area C, the road leading to it is not. Part of the road leading to it is Area B. And as such, this is not a town and this is not a site that can just, you can go to at any time. To Shiloh, I can just get up in the morning and decide I wanna to go to Shiloh. I can spend an entire day there feeling great, feeling peaceful. It's wonderful, it's safe. In order to get to Shomron Sebastia, you have to coordinate with the army, usually through an organization called Midreshet Tashomron. It's like a field school for the Shomron. Um, very often one has to go either in bulletproof or rockproof buses. I don't think that I have ever gone to that site without being stoned by rocks by the villagers there. And they have taken over the site and the narrative as well as their own. You can see at the top of the picture, it's from the reverse side, you can see part of the site. Now this is the top, this is part of the ancient Israelite capital. You can see very clearly that there are no marked paths, there are no signs. The area is not fixed up at all as we would expect from a national park. And uh, there are so many amazing things that have happened there just to fill you up on your history. You've heard of Ahav, you've heard of Jezebel, you've heard of Elijah the prophet, all here. Some of the most, for about 160, 170 years until the Assyrians come in and destroy the Northern Kingdom and exile most of the Israelites, not all, but some, and mix up the populations. This is the capital. And some of the most extraordinary and fascinating stories of the Bible have happened here. Now, what is happening, of course, all the time is that this area is being plundered. Um, I just want to just do a little segue because this is so amazing. In 1908, Harvard, no less than Harvard University, sent an archeological expedition to dig at Shomron and Sebastia. And among the things that they found, incredible finds like ivory, a whole collection of ivory, apparently it was in furniture. Of course, the wood is long gone, but the ivory still remains. They found a group of ostraca, close to 70 different ostraca, which are, they don't have inherent value. It's not like gold or jewelry. It's writing on shards of clay. As Eliana so eloquently described, the clay is the ubiquitous thing that we have that remains in the archaeological sites. But this writing, which you can see is in ancient Hebrew and paleo Ivrit, spoke about people that we know about from the Bible. You can call them the first feminists in the biblical world, the daughters of Tzlofchad, the five women from the tribe of Menashe, who say to Moses, it's not acceptable to us that because we have no brothers, our family will not inherit in the land. We would also like to inherit. Well, he kicks it all the way upstairs to God himself. And the answer is girls, you've got it. And so these girls inherit the land, these women inherit the land in that area of Menashe, in that area of Northern Shomron, it's quite a large area. And what these ostraca show us is the names of some of the daughters of Tzlofchad and the names of some of their children and their grandchildren, which means that hundreds of years after the conquest of the land, the taxes that are being paid, because what were these shards? They were on pottery that was, what do we never get away from? Taxes. So what does the king collect in the ancient world? He collects the best food, the best oil, the best wine. And so from these areas, they were sent to the king, sent to the palace, sent to the capital. And this is what remains. They have paid their taxes from this area. The family of Aviezer, the family of Gid'on, the judge whom we know about. So popping up from the ground, literally the biblical texts, the families and the women who fought so hard in order that they get an inheritance. I cannot imagine the what would have happened had the expedition gone now, these shards probably wouldn't be there. And the destruction that goes on every single day is just 
It's possibly the most egregious of all of the Judea and Samaria. What you're seeing in this picture right now is the remains of the theater, not an amphitheater, that's a circle, a theater that was built by Herod the Great in his magnificent city, which was Sebastia, which was in honor of the Caesar at the time of Octavian, of Augustus. And I want to thank, by the way, both Adi from her organization and both and Nomi Linder Khan from Regavim for providing me with these pictures. These are seats in the theater and this is a previously unknown hole in the bottom of the seats there that was uncovered by Palestinian thieves. And we don't know what it is that they took out of there that had not been discovered before. Whatever was in there is now long gone. And that is just one example of the destruction that is being wrought on the site every single day. This, by the way, for some of our Christian viewers, is a church that's also on site. This is associated with John the Baptist, who of course was beheaded uh, in Machaerus on the other side of the Jordan River. And there is a long tradition that for a while his head was kept here in this site. There is so much history. You can hear my enthusiasm. I love guiding the site, but every time I come there, and it's one of the few sites where I walk around, my Bible is open every single step of the way, and there are tears in my eyes as I go through because of what we see here. And uh, so I would like to now talk to Eliana um, about Shiloh and about Sebastia and about um, some of the differences in our sites. Shiloh being secure because of the area around it. She and I as tour guides can take people not just to the tell, but we can go on a hike, we can go on ATV rides, we can go to the winery and get a little, you know, tipsy. And Sebastia, it's an entirely different story. Eliana, are you with me? You're muted. Yeah, I'm here with you. Um, I'm not muted anymore. I just, it's heartbreaking. I was in Sebastia, not often enough, and it's just heartbreaking to see the graffiti, the graffiti that says Allah all over it um, in that church you pointed out. And um, Sebastia has the potential to be the Caesarea of the Shomron. I mean, it's just so beautiful and so meaningful. And those ostracons, I mean, it's it's incredible. It and really it's heartbreaking. Is. Heartbreaking. What what do you feel can be done in that in that site? Well, there is actually one more picture that I did want to show that I want to put up. This is how they just like play their games. I mean, look, this is like a soccer net in the middle of the site. But this this tells so much. This is a so-called Palestinian tour guide. Um, I don't know. Our course was two years. I think there's was like maybe two days. There's not a whole lot of history to talk about there. But what he says is, He's talking to the Israelis. He's right and he's wrong. He said, you are the um, oppressors, you're the occupiers of this place, but you have abandoned it. He's right on the second part. We have abandoned it. He's wrong on the first part. We are the liberators of this place. We are not the occupiers. And the only thing that I can say in answer to your really on mark question is that we have to do whatever we can to get this site back. Um, it's not enough to say that it's part of the Area C. If we can't get there safely, and if we can't guard it, then we have abandoned it for all intents and purposes. And it's not just a, it's not just a Jewish history site, as I said. It's an unbelievable site for anybody who's interested in any kind of history whatsoever. And I think that it behooves us to, and that's why we did these programs. That's why we've done these mega events, so that our listeners and our viewers will hopefully be as shaken as we are, those of us who know what is really happening and do something and uh, and join us in, in fighting this fight before it's too late because this damage is irreversible. It absolutely you, is. I, it makes me feel like I wanna get into the car and drive out there. If I'm coming for Cholamwad Pesach, how do I, how do I, how can I just take my family and go to Sebastia? What do I have to do? Who do I have to call? Okay, so there's this organization, Midreshet HaShomron, and we can make their information available, and you call, and what they do is they organize with the army, that we have uh, army escorts. Um, just know, though, that it can change up until the minute that you get there, this can all change, because unfortunately, terror wins, and if they, if they say that they're going to be violent or they're going to put something on the road, then people won't come. Um, you are the mother of a large family, as am I. And we learned long ago that if your kid throws a tantrum and you give in, you have just set up the next tantrum. By not dealing properly with the terrorism there and everywhere else, 
um, we are just causing it to get greater and greater and evil to be able to control the area. And that is that it's nothing to do with politics or nothing to do with anything else that has just to do with the kind of moral and just world that we want to live in that those are not the people who can set our agenda and prevent us from visiting sites and with connecting with places that mean so much to all of us uh, and to so many people around the world. That's the way. So that's, that's, it. that's an idea. Um, when, I, when I walk through ancient Chilo and I see that um, the government has put a lot of money, the regional council, um, there it's, it's guarded at all times. It's in the circumference of the town of Shiloh and people, people can come at any time and you can look it up online and pay. Um, I think one of the major differences is between these two sites, these two capital cities are uh, the presence of the Israeli government. Is that something you? Well, the, and the presence of the Israeli army uh, until we put sovereignty on Judea and Samaria and make it part of the civilian basis, of course, of, of Israel and put Israeli law on it. Right now, they are our long arm, uh, our sons, our soldiers. And but there has to be uh, there has to be orders or there has to be some kind of decision made that this is something worth protecting. Of course, lives come first, but these sites are not far behind and they all they all go together with having a normal semblance of life in Judea and Samaria. And of course, being able to welcome guests from all over the world who want to come and tour safely. And that is something that we absolutely all have to work for uh, any way that we can. So on okay. one hand, watching your presentation could be depressing, but on the other hand, Shiloh is an example uh, of a site. Uh, it's an example of an, of an answer to, or a, a way to solve our problems. And I think the next person up that you're going to introduce is the governor of the Benjamin Regional Council. And he's been doing yes. a lot of great work uh, for Shiloh. So maybe we can... Um, We'll pass it on to him. Right. Can't just be a yeah, lady. Well, <laughs> we have to throw a gentleman here and there. It's only right. Okay, Eliana, thank you so much. And really, um, just and Mazal Tov to you on your growing family. Yeah. That is so absolutely the most important thing. Okay, on to our next, the as Eliana said, the governor of the Benjamin Regional Council is Israel Gantz. Um, by area, this is the largest regional council in all of Israel. The area under his, under his jurisdiction is home to over 80,000 residents and thousands of archeological sites. He works tirelessly to develop and protect these sites and bring tourists from all over the globe to the area. He will now say a few words and time permitting, ask a question or two from our very devoted audience, Israel Gantz. Thank you very much, Eve. And I want to thank the ZOA and the Yesha Council for the special opportunity to discuss the, the, this important issue. Where we are talking about Asian historical site, we are talking about our responsibility for all the world to keep that site intact for the next generation. We are talking about our traditional, our tradition, our nationality, our religion. And we are talking about our rights in the Holy Land. But the reason that we are now sitting, sing, sitting together and discussing this issue, this issue is because the Palestinian Authority found exactly that point. Today, they have employees that all their job is to try to erase our historical site. Today, we know that more than 80% of the ancient historical site has been damaged. Part of them has been erased and part only have been damaged, but our mission is to stop this movement. I want to share with you uh, one example from Jericho. Near Jericho, we have the second largest Jewish Asian cemetery. It located at the Hasmonaim Winter Palaces. It was a Kohanim cemetery. And I want to share with you what happened to that cemetery. Look at that. If you see, they destroyed the cave. They threw out the bones. We are seeing that right, what you see right now, a Kohanim bones. And they threw all the bones on the ground.
when I saw that pictures, I was shocked. Think about it. Those people served in Beit HaMikdash in the second temple. Now someone destroyed the barrier and he, they took out all the bones and broke the bones and threw it out on the ground. It took us three days with a lot of partners to collect all the bones and we made a, a second ceremony. You can see, I want to show you. We built a new memorial in Kfar Domim for its, um, uh, let's say a family barrier for all the bones, for all that family. Now, it's for us, it's a mission to stop it. We are here and we have to change the situation. So what are we doing? First of all, we are, work, we are working with the staff officer of archeology span of Judea and Samaria to put a stop to the pillaging and destruction of the ancient sites. We established a new department. It's called land, the Department of Land Preservation. We are working with the uh, preserving the, the eternal and we have inspectors all over the day that are driving and looking after those people that are trying to destroy our history. When they, find, when they find some, they call, of course, the police to arrest them. And the, three, the third one, the third step that we do, we are trying to develop the ancient site because we know, like as you mentioned about Shiloh, the difference between Shiloh and Sabastia is, is that we invest a lot of money in Shiloh. Now it's open for everyone. You can come very safety. You can see, you can feel, you can touch the history. So we're raising money and part of the government, part of good people, and we're trying to dig and to open this site for everyone. And we know that when people coming and feel safety, we can keep that for the next generation. For summarize, today we have a battle about our history, about our tradition. We are doing a lot to stop this movement. And I want to invite you to see to dig with us and to keep this important site for everyone. Thank you, Yisrael Gantz. We have a question. We have quite a few questions from our audience. We're going to have time for one. Um, as we all know, Jordan occupied Judea and Samaria and, uh, between 1948 and 1967, and of course, ethnically cleansed all the Jews out of our ancient homeland. Is the abuse and the, and the destruction of the heritage sites worse now in areas that the PA, the Palestinian Authority has access to than it was during those 19 years? Or is this kind of a continuation of something that we saw a few decades ago? No, it's much, much worse because they understood that if they want to build a Palestinian state, they think they have to destroy that ancient site because they understand that we can see, all the world can see our rights, our history, um, our traditions and that side. So today it became a method. They have people that all the day their job is to look after uh, that site and try to make a damage. It's much, much worse right now. And the frustration of course, is that this is when Israel is ostensibly um, in control of these areas. Yisrael Gantz, thank you so much. Thank you so much also for everything that you do. I know you're very often in Washington, D.C. and doing whatever you can um, to wake people up to the reality here and, uh, and very much appreciated. Yigal Dalmoni, who is going to be our final speaker for the evening, is the CEO of Moetzid Yesha, the umbrella council of the communities of Judea and Samaria and the Jordan Valley. He will deliver final remarks as we close this series of events. Eagle. Hi, hello everybody. Good morning, New York. Good morning, United States. And good evening here in Israel. I will speak very shortly. Uh, for everyone that watched at that event, we, at that tree event, that we bring you the story of Judea and Samaria. And a lot of people ask what we can do. We hear the problem, we hear all your challenge, what we can do, what you ask us to do to help you. 
So first, we think there are be our big challenge here and our big challenge around the world is education, is educate people. People have to believe and have to understand that this land is belong to the Jewish nation and they have to know what is our challenge here in Judea and Samaria, like the unlegal takeover the land by Palestinian, like the Palestinians that uh, destroyed our archaeologic site and our Iraqi sites, and how uh, Judea and Samaria is very important to the state of Israel in the, in the economic, in the um, security side, and other in, in the transportation and other uh, point of view. And so when you hear it and when you see it in your eyes, you can tell it everyone. If everyone that's watching now at this uh, great webinar will take what he learned here and what he hear in that uh, in, at, in that Zoom and tell to his family and then to and tell it to his shul and tell it to to his community and speak about it and share it with his friends, it will be um, magnificent. Magnificent. It will be uh, great for us that everyone will know and will hear about Judea and Samaria. This is the first thing that you can do. Please share it, tell people. People don't know what's happened here. And now you are know what's happened here at Judea and Samaria and you can tell people and, uh, and educate people and help us uh, uh, slowly, slowly to educate people all over the world. Second, you can come here to visit us and see in your eyes what's happened and then we can uh, take you, you can connect us uh, at, in the website of uh, Yesha Council and others, uh, an other way, and you can uh, uh, see in your eyes and then you can, um, you know, the, the saying, the, there is no like seeing in your eyes something, it's not, it's, it's be better that to hear. And when you will came here to visit us, to be in our sites, to be in our communities, it will make us strong. And the third thing that you can do is if you are involved and, and you can push your government or your uh, people uh, that you know in state, in Washington, the other side, to help and to push your, uh, uh, Israel and your government to uh, keep this site uh, and, uh, and keep this archaeologic site and keep our land. And, I, and finally, I want to say thank you to everyone that be here until this time and to all the people that help us to do it and will not tell all the names because it's very I, I i i don't want to forget someone but the zoa and my israel and one israel fund and the legavim and shomrim al and um, um, all other uh, organization uh, that help us to arrange and that speed that, that to, to arrange this uh, uh, this great event and please take the video from the YouTube and share it to everyone. And finally, I think it's very important to see again the our president, uh, Itzhak Herzog, and the, what he say in the first, in the opening of this, that event, I, I want, I ask you, the people that are in, that's standing behind, please uh, put the video of uh, President Herzog again. It's very important to see what our president say uh, this is uh, very important to us. I think it's very important to all over, all over the world that people will know that even our president, Itzhak Herzog, is support in Yesha Council and support in what we're doing here to keep our, our Iraqid and our historic uh, site. Please, uh, thank you, Omer, for all, all what you've done, but please, Omer, put again uh, um, President Herzog. Dear friends, I welcome this important platform, the Judea and Samaria virtual mega event, as an opportunity to affirm the millennia old bonds of history and heritage, binding the Jewish people to this land, the land of Israel. Much of the Jewish people's history in this land is rooted in the hills and valleys of Judea and Samaria. Here in Yehuda Shomron, our patriarchs and matriarchs lived and were laid to rest. Here, Joshua led the sons and daughters of Israel, Bnei Israel, into the land. King David began his rule. Our prophets spread their teachings, which we teach until today and every Shabbat. 
and Jewish rebels from the Maccabees to Bar Kokhba fought for what they believed in. Beyond any political dispute, we should all agree to protect the integrity of Jewish historical and archaeological sites throughout the land of Israel, as well as historical sites belonging to other religions and cultures which have left their stamp on this region throughout the ages. This is not just a Jewish or Israeli issue, but an issue of protecting the heritage of all humanity in the Holy Land. Dear friends, it is our duty to guarantee through word and action that there is no contradiction between Israel's unique status as the Jewish national home and its existence as a democracy built on equality and religious freedom. A democracy which welcomes, respects, and makes room for all of God's creations. As we work to preserve the past, we must also lay the groundwork for a safe, hopeful future based on a viable peace in the region. As the historic Abraham Accords have shown, the path to peace runs through win-win cooperation, tolerance, and dialogue. I pray that the new winds of peace blowing through our region will enable us to work together to lay the foundations for a future of coexistence, stability, and mutual prosperity. I would like to thank Yesha Council, My Israel, and the Zionist Organization of America for organizing this important conference. Just like my predecessor, President Rivlin, I thank you, dear friends in Israel and in the United States, for all that you do on behalf of Am Israel and Medinat Israel. Take good care. Also, thank you, Eve. Thank you all. And as we wrap up tonight's programming, I just want to remind everybody that in a few days' time, we are going to be celebrating the wonderful holiday of Purim. And we read the book of Esther, which talks about how the Jews were saved from annihilation. And they were saved because they took action. Yes, you can make a very good case that there was a miracle at the end of the story. But it came because people did something. They saw something was wrong and they took action. And my favorite line from the book of Esther is when Mordechai, the advisor to the king, says to Esther, the queen, who nobody knows is Jewish, maybe it is for this time that you became queen. We all have the ability to do something. You're either a person of influence or you know people of influence. You have the ability to support all or some of the organizations that are behind these mega events. Maybe you are watching these shows for a reason, educating yourself to what is happening here because you are supposed to be part of the solution and not part of the problem or sitting on the fence. I want to wish you all a healthy rest of the year and being able to get on a plane and come to visit us here in Judea and Samaria. We're not going anywhere. We are all Shomrim Alanetzach. We are all preserving the eternal for all of you. I'm Eve Harrow, very honored to have moderated tonight's show. And I thank everybody who was totally involved and made this happen. Take care of everybody and let everything be good for all of us.